Good evening. I want to thank Rabbi Shore, who's uh, one of the superstars of the OU, and it's an honor to be here in Yerushalayim, Mirakodesh, in the Holy City. And I thought what we would do tonight is relive an event that I think all of you will be seeing the film. The movie's going to be coming out, I think, in the next six weeks. And that, of course, is the event that really shaped modern Jewish history. And it's an event that, to put it in a frame of reference, it took us, the Jewish nation, out of a terrible malaise. To put a context to this event, we're not going to start with uh, June 27, 1976. That's when the event started. We're going to take a few, few years back. We had, of course, the September 72 Olympics, the Munich Olympics. And what happened to our nation and our people created a real sense of malaise that Germany of all places, this would befall the Jewish people. And then a year later was, of course, the terrible events of the Yom Kippur War. You had over 3,000 people that lost their lives. How many young men, the future of the nation, the lucky ones, their mothers received them back in a body bag. The unlucky ones were burnt into charcoal in their tanks. And this didn't have to happen. This was a tragedy of hubris. And in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, the various commissions that be co-wrote, no one can beat ourselves up like we do. Right? When it comes to self-flagellation, the Jews, we have the monopoly on that. And we looked and we pointed fingers. And by the way, there were many, many places to point. Across the board, the general staff, it forced Golda Meir to resign as prime minister. And there was a real sense of depression and malaise that overcame the Jewish nation. That's the context of this story. And I left out something that will mention the tragedy of Ma'alot. So when we get into this story, I'll tell you where I want to start. I want to start with a young couple. Both of them children of Hungarian survivors. And this young couple lives the dream that only their grandparents and great-grandparents could hallucinate about. For the first time in the lineages of both families, they were actually going to come to the soil, come to the Holy Land. They had a young daughter, left her with the parents, and they came to experience Jerusalem, to daven at the Kotel, to spend a Shabbos in Yerushalayim. And it was a magical week they spent in Israel. And the morning is the morning of June 27th, 1976. After a magical week, it's time to go home. At that time, at Ben Gurion at the Lod Airport, first, the first step in security was you gave in your bags, they were sent for screening, and then they were sent to the cargo hall. After that, you then went to the counter to the desk. And they get to the desk, and instead of going straight to New York, they're going to spend a trip, a day and a half, in the great European city of Paris. They'll see the Louvre, the Mona Lisa, they'll experience the Eiffel Tower, nice kosher restaurants, many Sephardic Jews in Paris. And they'll experience Paris because when will they have a chance ever again to fly transatlantic to come? Maybe decades, maybe years. It's not like today when we travel every Mundik and Dunnishtik, you're on a plane, right? So what happened? They get to the gate. They're about to take Air France Flight 139 directly to Paris. And George grabs his wife, Renee. They look up at the screen. Air France Flight 139, which when they booked it, was a direct flight from Tel Aviv to Paris, it's stopping in Athens. And he says, we're not stopping in Athens. Everyone knows the worst security of anywhere in Europe is Athens. And the woman behind the counter says, Mr. You want to fly direct to Paris? The only direct flight is not till tomorrow evening. And something else, you don't want to get on the plane? We can't go into the cargo hole. Your luggage, your bags are in the cargo hole. They're going to Paris via Athens. He turns, he looks at his wife. Renee, what do we do? They hem, they haw. 
We can't delay it. I have to be back in work in New York. They decide to get on the plane. And the plane takes off. Going from Tel Aviv to Athens is nothing. You know, it's like going from, from New York to Washington. It's nothing. Plane takes off, lands fine. 58 new passengers get on Air France, Air France Flight 139 in Athens. We are interested in four of the new passengers. Two of them are Germans. Members of the infamous Bader Meinhof gang. One of them, a man by the name of Wilfred, see, it's pronounced, it's, it's red, B O S E, like Bose or Bose speakers, but there's an umlau over the O. Wilfred Bose, really Bose. And the other, Brigitte Kuhlmann. Now, what was Bader Meinhof? They were anarchists. It was a terrorist gang that would take down anything and everything. They partnered with the Jackal. They partnered with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They partnered, their goal was to bring down the establishment, Western governments, to undermine the establishment. And in this deal, they are partnering with who? The PFLP. George Chabash and his group had a split with Yasser Arafat. They felt that Arafat, who was one of the greatest child killers in modern history, wasn't strong enough, didn't take action in a more significant way, in an acute enough way, and he broke off. And the PFLP is famous. It was 1970 when there were four jets that were flown to Amman and then were blown up over Jordan. The PFLP had done other things. So what happened? Two members of the PFLP got on a flight in Bahrain. Now, the security in Bahrain is terrible. In their luggage, their hand luggage, were grenades, were guns. In their vests were guns. And once you land in Athens, inter airport, there's no security in Athens. They can go from one gate to the other. They, together with Brigitte Kuhlmann and Wilfred Bös, sit in first class. The plane takes off from Athens to Paris. Once it hits flying altitude and it starts to smooth out, they rush the cockpit. They commandeer the flight. And the lives of the people on this plane and our lives will never be the same. George said the first time in his life he'd ever seen a gun was Brigitte Kuhlmann when she slams her gun in his chest says, get out of that seat. She took all of the males out of the aisle seats because she felt there's less of a chance if females sit in the aisle seats that they'll jump them or stop them. So all males were put again in window and middle seats and females in aisle seats. They fly. First of all, the planes on radio silence. When you lose communication with a plane, it's not a very good thing. It means one of two phenomena. Either the flight has gone down, there's been a crash, or the flight has been commandeered. They don't know what's happening. They fly, they land, in what they will find out is Benghazi, Libya. Muammar Gaddafi, right, one of the Lamed Vav Tzadikim of this universe, was a great sympathizer with the PFLP and with the Palestinian cause. And they refuel the plane. And they bring supplies. And they clean out the toilets. And they're on the plane. It's hot. This is the summer. This is late June. We're in Benghazi, Libya. Finally, after a few hours, the plane takes off. It's night already. It's already Sunday night. They have no clue where they're going. And they fly what seems to be an endless amount of time. When they land, they have no idea where they are. All they see on the tarmac are black soldiers, 
black armed soldiers in uniform. Where are they? They're in sub-Saharan Africa. They're in Kampala, Uganda, the Entebbe airport. The world now finds out what happened to Air France Flight 139. The hijackers, who were met by three other members of the PFLP, who had, one had traveled actually from South America, from Colombia, they had been met there. And they were accompanied by what seemed to be somewhere between 90 and 110 Ugandan soldiers. They make their demands. Five million dollars cash, United States dollars, and 53 of our comrades in arms, 40 who are being held by the Zionists in Zionist prisons. Six who are being held by the Jordanians, you're all familiar with Black September and what King Hussein had to do to the Palestinians who are going to undermine the Jordanian, his country and his rulership. Six who are being held in Jordan. Six West Germans, members of Bader Meinhof, including Bader himself, being held in West German prisons. It's 52, and I apologize, I forgot where the 53rd was held. Deadline, Thursday, July 1st. You don't liberate, you don't emancipate our brethren in arms, the hostages die. The whole world is focused on Israel. Who is in Israel? Three men that lead the country. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. For the first time, he is the Prime Minister of Israel. After Golda Meir has to resign, he takes over. His defense minister, Shimon Peres. Now, Shimon Peres had done some great things for the state of Israel, which we eternally will be indebted to him. First and foremost, working with the French, the creation of Demona. But Shimon Peres should have been the defense minister like I should be the emperor of China, meaning he had done some great things but he was not a military man. It was because he was the number two in the Labour Party, and after Prime Minister, that was the most coveted political position. And you'll see where Perez is out of his league in that position. And number three, General Mata Gur. Only nine years later, as Colonel Mata Gur, the man who led the 55th Brigade of Paratroopers, the man who liberated Yerushalayim, is now the head of the whole IDF. Why Kampala, Uganda? Why Entebbe Airport, of all places? Why? Two years earlier, the PFLP had commandeered a Sabina Boeing 707, I should say, Sabina Airlines. Remember the Belgian airline, Sabina? Allah v'shalom. I won't say Zichrona Levracha, but Allah v'shalom, right? So they commandeered a Boeing 707. They landed it with the hostages on the runway of Lod, of Ben Gurion Airport outside of Tel Aviv. A young man at the time, his name was classified. His elite platoon was classified. This man would go on to become the most storied soldier in the history of the IDF. A man by the name of Ehud Barak led a group which today every one of us knows at that time was classified. The name of the group was Sayeret Matkal. What is Sayeret Matkal? In the aftermath of Yasser Arafat sending his goons, his animals, to butcher and murder school children in Malot in northern Israel, Israel created something, a military subunit, whose goal was not primarily military. It was an anti-terror unit. If a school would be commandeered, if a bus would be commandeered, if a plane, a train, to do those kind of missions. And the man that headed this told the 
the, he and his team got dressed up as what? As custodians who are going to come onto the plane, bring in food, water, clean the, water, the dirty soiled water from the toilets, engineers, mechanics who are coming on the plane. In fact, they made one mistake in the preparation. The uniforms were too clean. So he had the guys roll around in the tarmac on Ben Gurion. So they looked schmutzedick. They weren't, you know, they soiled them. They get on the plane, and one of the great miracles of our time, they commandeer the plane from the terrorists. In the aftermath of Sabina 707, 1974, George Chabash and Wadi Haddad, who oversaw this mission, said, we are going to take that plane as far as we can humanly get from Tel Aviv. No Israeli soldiers, no Israeli supermen or superheroes are going to have access to our hostages. Why Uganda? 3,800, that's if you fly direct, that's as the eagle flies, 3,800 kilometers from Tel Aviv? Because of Idi Amin Dada. Idi Amin Dada butchered annihilated 300,000 of his fellow Ugandans. Idi Amin. Now keep in mind, what was Uganda? For that matter, what was most of black Africa? These were very poor nations. Who Israel? Under Golda Meir, long before she became prime minister of this great country, when she was the foreign minister, she was a student who always it rang in her ears the words of Theodore Herzl that he had this vision that Israeli water engineers would make the desert bloom. Israeli, he didn't call them Israeli, Jewish water engineers, because there was no Israel in the time of Herzl, would help the world feed the world. Very much like the vision that Chaim Weizmann had, that through science and technology, we would make the world a better place. Golda Meir, already in the late 50s, is foreign minister of this country. She sent Israeli water engineers to black Africa to work with the populations and feed those starving populations. And Israel had wonderful relations with the black African nations until 1972. What, of course, happened in 1972? The OPEC oil embargo. When essentially the Arab oil producing nations said with Venezuela, you know, all the Heligat Sadiqim, they said to the world, to these nations, you're going to lose your power. When the basic cost of energy goes skyrockets, your people are going to revolt. You got two choices. We will sell you cheap oil. We will actually bring in Russian equipment and get you at cheap prices Soviet military equipment on two conditions. You throw the Jews out. Get rid of the Zionists. And you allow us and Russia to have influence in your governments. With the exception of Kenya, these nations showed tremendous gratitude to Israel and the Jewish people and threw us out. With the exception of Kenya. And one of the people who threw us out was Idi Amin Dada. This was a guy who was trained as other Ugandans by Israeli military. He was a willing partner to allow the PFLP to land with their hostages. The world is focused on Israel. Because even though Yitzhak Rabin has been saying to the world, this is an Air France flight. This is not an Israeli issue. This is a French issue. The world was focused on Israel because 40 of the hostages were being held in Israeli prisons. The Germans said to the Israelis, we will follow your lead on this. Now, a selexia was made. As they were about to get off the plane after the longest day in their lives, terrorists said, we want everyone's identity cards. We want to see your passport. 
There happened to be a former Israeli Air Force pilot who was a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. He ripped up his military card and swallowed it. He said, if they find this, I'm dead. And he swallowed it because he didn't want them finding it. And a selexia was made. Israelis, 89 of them with Israeli passports, and four conspicuous-looking Jews. George and, and Rivka, or Rene, because he had a yarmulke on his head, and two other conspicuous-looking Jews were put with the Israelis. They were separated from all of the other hostages. So you had 150 in one part of the old terminal of Entebbe, and 93 in another part. Now, the world is looking at Israel. And Israel had had a policy until that time. From the inception, the start of the country, the policy was we don't negotiate with terrorists. Never. We don't negotiate with terrorists. By the way, those of you who have children or grandchildren, I would recommend that policy vis-a-vis -vis your family, not to negotiate with terrorists. But the family members of the hostages and all of this was shown on Israeli television. They're protesting outside the Prime Minister's office. Prime Minister Rabin was in Tel Aviv. He was not in the Prime Minister's home here around the corner in Yerushalayim. In Nebuch. I guess Israeli construction at that time wasn't so good. They break down the gate and they rush the Prime Minister's office. And what was their argument? You just traded with the Egyptians. You traded live Egyptian soldiers, POWs, for our boys who came back in body bags. What's the exactly is the difference between the Egyptians and the Palestinians? The Egyptians want to annihilate us. The Palestinians want to annihilate us. Why? Because Egypt is a sovereign nation, is a country, and the Palestinians don't. Have, uh, they're, they're terrorists. So we negotiate with Egyptians. We don't negotiate with Palestinians. And they went, they were wild. They were crazy over this. The prime minister calls in the opposition leader, Menachem Begin, the leader of what today we call the Likud, the Cherut party. And he says to him, we have nothing. The whole world is looking at us, and it's ultimately the fate not only of the Jews, the Israelis, the fate of the Gentiles as well is in our hands. Shimon Peres had three harebrained hair plans that he, he suggested, and literally the members of the labor cabinet, you know, th they pushed him away. They said, are you crazy? One idea he had is, we're going to send a thousand IDF soldiers in. And Rabin looked at him. Yeah. With a thousand soldiers, you'll take over the capital city, Kampala. And in the meantime, all the hostages will be killed. Is that, is that your goal? Then he had another idea. Somebody in the IDF had this harebrained plan. We're going to do an amphibious assault. Because the border of Kenya and Uganda is Lake Victoria. And in Lake Victoria, unlike those of you from America, unlike Orlando, Disneyland, you know, unless it's a two-year-old baby, alligators, for the most part, are not aggressive. They will attack if they feel threatened. Crocodiles are aggressive. They attack. He says, you're going to send my elite soldiers on an amphibious assault. They'll never make it out of Lake Victoria. The big crocodile dinner. You got nothing. You got nothing militarily. And he called in Begin. He says, we have nothing. I have no choice but to negotiate. And you talk about what a leader is. Begin said to him, and this we know from a number of sources. One of them is Yehuda Avner. Begin said to him, it's irrelevant whether I agree or disagree with you. That's not the point. This is a national crisis. This is the fate of the nation at stake. Now is not a time for partisan politics. So whether I think you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, the world will know today and the world will know forever that I'm backing you. That's a leader. Robin announces to the world that he'll negotiate. Only the New York Post could do this. Those of you who know what I'm talking about. Wednesday's New York Post 
in big, bold, black letters. Israel surrenders. That was the, the cover of the New York Post. Israel surrenders. What did that mean? It was the last nation that had stood up against terrorism. And now even the Israelis were going to capitulate, appease, and buckle to terrorism. What this did is that the terrorists, once negotiations were going, did two things. Number one, they released 150-some passengers. Any passenger that was not an Israeli or a conspicuous-looking Jew. They had Air France bring in a plane from Nairobi, Kenya, which was literally no distance from, from Kampala. And they flew them to Paris. Number two, they extended the deadline to Sunday morning, July 4th at 8 a.m. Why Sunday morning, July 4th, 1976 at 8 a.m.? Two reasons. Idi Amin was finishing his term. It was always a two-year rotational term as the president of the African, the African League of Nations. Uganda had a two-year term, and he was flying on Thursday to Mauritius, because Mauritius was now going to be, for the next two years, the president of the African nations. And he said, nothing happens. He told the terrorists, nothing happens when I'm gone. He wasn't coming back till Saturday night. What was the other reason why they chose the date Sunday morning, July 4th, 1976? the bicentennial of the United States of America. The whole world is going to be in America with President Gerald R. Ford. Queen Elizabeth, the very country that we re had the revolution against, she even schlepped her husband with. She's going to be there with the Americans. The Germans, the French, the whole Chad Gadya of the Western world is going to be with America. And Idi Amin is going to take the stage He's going to take world news from the Americans. Here's where the miracle really gets started. When these passengers, former hostages, land in Paris, today we call it the Gaulle Airport, before they can be reunited with their families, who is it that they meet there? The Mossad with French intelligence. The Mossad interviews almost everyone, together with French intelligence. And they come out of this on Wednesday with two conclusions. One is fantastic, the other is terrible. The good news, with 90 to 95 percent certainty, they believe that the terrorists are lying because all week they've threatened the place is booby-trapped. We've got the whole terminal booby-trapped, you get smart with us, you play any games with us, boom! They believe, after talking to people, in fact, one character actually was taking his pen and poke, poking into the walls that were supposedly booby-trapped. It was actually filled with coffee beans. So thank God we could do a military attack. Here's the terrible news. This is not for terrorists. First of all, it's seven, because three joined them. More than that. Their worst suspicions were now confirmed. Idi Amin, contrary to what he lied to the world, saying that they showed up, what could he do? He was playing the role of peacemaker. Idi Amin was in cahoots with the terrorists. Because on the second floor of the terminal, somewhere between 80 to 100 Ugandan soldiers were being quartered there. This is a military operation. This is not an anti-terror operation. It's a military operation. First miracle. Any of you know people, we refer to them as a pack rat? They never throw out a newspaper. You know people like that? There was an Israeli construction firm who was doing work in Uganda before Idi Amin threw us out. In 1976, there was a new terminal in Tebi. This was the old terminal. The old terminal at one time wasn't built as the old terminal. It was built as what? The terminal, the new terminal. The Israeli firm was given the architectural blueprints 
and allowed to bid on it. They didn't get the bid. It was an Italian firm that built that terminal. But they had the architectural blueprints, which he gave to the IDF. And based upon the interviews, everything is the same. No walls have been changed. No entrances have been changed. The VIP room where the hostages said that's where the, the terrorists were sleeping, that is there. The entrance is there. The stairwells going up to the second floor, which were quartering the Ugandan soldiers, everything was there in the blueprint. They could set up a Hollywood set now and actually try and practice a military mission. Number two, every time that Idi Amin came, he came in the following. A stretch black Mercedes limousine with a Ugandan flag on the hood, escorted by two Range Rovers with his soldiers, his elite soldiers. Every time he had come, that's how he had come to the airport. Now we have a surprise. We can do this. Number three, a little problem. How do we exactly get all those soldiers, all those medical personnel, all the way to Uganda? Well, a young group from the Israeli Air Force had spent the last four months in Georgia. Many of you, I'm sure, in your retirement portfolios or in your equity portfolio, you have Martin Marietta stock. At that time, it was Lockheed Martin before that merged with, with Marietta. And Lockheed Martin had a plant in Georgia where they produced something that in Yiddish we call a mamazetzer. What am I referring to? The Hercules C-130. The Hercules C-130 is a transport plane. You could transport trucks, Humvees, multiple troops. Well, there was a young man, a child of survivors, by the name of Yahushua Shami. Today, he holds a very esteemed position with the IAF. He's, he's like, he's like he's, uh, what, what do you call that, like an emeritus position. Shuki Shami was in his 20s then. He led a squadron. For the first time ever, Martin Marietta had sold these Hercules C-130 cargo transport planes to Israel. They could actually transport troops all the way to Uganda. So Mata Gur, General Gur, says to him, he says, boys, he says, them Georgia peaches, they share you with you some good old southern hospitality, give you some nice Georgia iced tea, take care of you boys. You had a good time down there with them Georgia peaches? Oh, yeah, they had a wonderful time. They treated us all so well. You know how to fly these things? You sure do. We know. Yeah, you kidding? We could fly. He said, boys, I got just two little questions for you. This is General Matagor. And these are guys in their 20s, you know, sitting there with the head of the IDF. Did they teach you how to land these things in the dark? Silence. Chachamim. What do you think? You're going to come to Uganda, and they're going to have the lights on. Baruchim habayim, and they're going to be playing Hava Nagila. I'm going to fly my elite soldiers and troops, and we'll die before the mission ever starts because we'll crash land in the dark. So you talk about you know ingenuity. Shuki Shami he says to General Matagur, "Could you give us a few minutes?" We'd like to have a conference and come back, General. They come back a few minutes later. As we said, they didn't teach us how to land these things in the dark. But what we did learn is that the radar on these planes, radar, when it bounces off of water, looks one way. When it bounces off of sand, radar looks a different way. And when it bounces off of tarmac, which is dense, radar looks a third way. Now, we're coming off of Lake Victoria into Ugandan territory proper. There's sand around the area, but the landing strips are tarmac. We think if we had to, we could land these things in the dark. 
Not bad for some young pilots, huh? So Matagur says, boys, I'll believe it when I see it. We're going tonight to Sharm el Sheikh, and this is another part of the miracle. This is before the Begin Sadat Accords. Today, the southernmost point in Israel is what? A lot. Not in 76. In 76, it was Sharm el Sheikh on the Straits of Tehran. I want to see you land this thing in the dark before you kill my best soldiers. So, all four planes, because that's what they were going to be taking, they fly in the dark. Matagur is sitting there in the cockpit with Shuki Shami. And he's in the dark, and the radar looks this way off the water, and the radar looks this way off the sand, and the radar looks this way off the tarmac. And he turns on his lights about maybe 35, 40 meters before landing, and he sees he's going to crash right into fence posts. So he takes that plane. He almost crashed the thing. He pulls it up, almost killed the general, the head of the IDF. The Matagur says, all right, sonny boy, turn this thing around and get it right the second time. Shuts the lights back off, turns the thing around. The second time, turns the lights on, he got it. He landed it, as did the second, the third, and the fourth planes. They were able to land it in the dark. Matagur asked one other question. We can't go directly to Uganda because these fat planes, we're going to have to fly under radio silence. We're going to have to fly under radar. Do you understand the kind of friction we're going to have flying that low to the ground? You can't fly over Egypt. You can't fly over Libya with dead ducks. They'll take us right out. We're going to go over the Yamsuf. We're going to go over the sea. And of all the nations that hate us the most, the one that we're the least afraid of, we're going to cross into Africa over Eritrea. Under radio silence, from Eritrea we'll go to Kenya, and which Kenya we're, is a friendly nation. And then from Kenya, we'll cross Lake Victoria into Uganda. Great, right? Yeah. One little problem. You could get there. How are you going to get home almost 4,000 kilometers. They don't have that kind of cargo, that kind of fuel capacity. You're going to think that you're going to be able to refuel in Uganda with a whole Ugandan army there? And you don't have the keys or the ability to access the, 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 the fuel? You can't risk that. They call up Kenya. There are two ministers in the government that they feel will give them secrecy and that they can talk to. And they asked them on late Wednesday, the negotiations are getting nowhere. We will not allow any Palestinian with innocent blood on his hands. We're not going to allow a Muslim with blood on his hands to be freed from our prisons. And the terrorists have said to us, the hijackers have said to us, you don't make the policy. You don't determine the terms of this deal. We do. And it's going nowhere. If we have to do a military mission, the only way we can do it is to be able to refuel to go home. Would you allow us to refuel in Nairobi? Dead silence. We need to think about this. We'll get back to you. Hours go by. The phone rings. Two conditions. Number one. Number one. You never called us. We never had this conversation. You're going to send an LL guy to the airport saying there's a flight coming home from South Africa that's got mechanical problems and needs to make an emergency landing. No problem. We can do that, 100%, no problem. Condition number two, we can tell this kind of crazy story and we can make up any story and the world will believe us. But Idi Amin is not going to believe us. Condition number two is he's got 11 
Russian MiGs sitting on the tarmac. You're going to take out those Russian MiGs. This went from being an anti-terror mission to a military mission. Now we're talking about destroying the whole Ugandan Air Force. You know what that means? You got to bring on this mission those Humvees with the RPGs planted on them. What do you think? You know, it's Tinkerbell to blow up a Russian MiG. What choice did they have? They had no choice. <laughs> they swallowed and said, "Okay, yes." The man who was supposed to be running this mission, Ehud Barak. Now that the Kenyans are involved, and they have the green light from Kenya, he has relations with the Kenyan military. He has to fly. He's part of the team that now has flown immediately to Kenya. A good friend of his, a member of Sayeret Makal, again, a man who no one knew this name. This was all classified. His father was a Jabotinsky Zionist. His father was the world's preeminent historian when it came to the Inquisition. The Inquisition of Spanish and Portuguese Jews is not something that happened over five or ten years. It lasted over three centuries. And the man who did the groundbreaking work on this, Ben Sion Netanyahu, who had been a visiting professor at Harvard, at Penn, at Temple, had three boys. His oldest, Yonatan, who after his first term of duty in the IDF, was accepted to Harvard University and graduated with a degree, an undergraduate degree in philosophy. The middle son, Binyamin or Bibi, he was accepted to MIT after his first term of duty, was at MIT getting a degree in engineering. It's hard to pronounce Netanyahu, so at MIT he was known as Ben Netta. Many of the Americans that he met was a Mormon from a very fine Mormon family by the name of Mitt Romney. Yoni Netanyahu, who's about to announce his engagement to his girlfriend, Buria. Buria and Yoni live literally a floor below Ehud Barak, who's a good friend of his, in a Tel Aviv apartment building. Yoni has a couple of months left in Sayeret Matkal. They're going to announce the engagement and get married a few months later. He's called up from the Negev. He's called up to take over for Barak and run this mission. It's now Thursday night. Let's skip to the Golan Heights. At that time, in 1976, the top fighting unit of the IDF are known as the Tzanchanim, the paratroopers. There's a young man who has literally two weeks left in his tour of duty in the IDF. The young man's name is Surin Hershko. Surin, as you know, is not a Hebrew name, is not a Yiddish name. It's a Romanian name. Unlike all other leaders of communist countries, Ceausescu in Romania was willing to do business with the Arabs and the Jews. In fact, he sold Jews for money. Israel bought Jews out of Romania. And the Hershko family was able to get out of Ceausescu's Romania. And the greatest honor this young man could do was to do his duty for his people, his nation. He became a member of the paratroopers. Egged buses show up about 10 p.m. on the Golan Heights at the paratrooper base. Boys, get your guns, get your ammo, don't pack much. Sleep on the bus because you don't have much sleep come in the next few days. They didn't know what, when, where. The buses take them down to the center of the country. At that point in 1976, no one had cell phones. But the young men were told, you're being quarantined. They get off the bus maybe you know, 1.45 a.m., 1.30 a.m., something like that. Go to sleep, you'll be woken up at 6. Don't bother changing, you might as well sleep in your clothes. You need every minute you're going to get. All day Friday, under Yoni Netanyahu, they practice. They strategize. A young man who would go on to become not only 
the head of the IDF, but a po politician in this country, a Persian immigrant, a man by the name of Shaul Mofaz, he is going to be overseeing the destruction of the Ugandan Air Force. Others, of which Surin Hershko and the Tzanchanim are responsible, their job when the plane lands is to commandeer and take control of the new terminal. Because the old terminal, which is one kilometer, 0.62 miles, a kilometer away, even if a miracle happens and they're able to free the hostages, together with the 12 members of Air France Flight 139, the captain who's about 93 years old today, one of the great figures in this story because they could have left, but the captain says we are not abandoning until the last passenger is freed, we do not abandon. That's not, was the, that wasn't the opinion of a lot of the flight attendants and others, but he was the one who controlled it. All 12 members under his insistence stayed with the Jews. There are 105 hostages, 93 Jews and 12 members of Air France 139. Even if you can liberate them, what happens? You're going to go back to where the plane is. You can't get the plane to the old terminal. You're going to drive them back because they took these Peugeot pickup trucks where they, they put the, they're going to put the people into the pickup trucks, drive the kilometer back. If the Ugandan soldiers in the new terminal are there, you'll have a firefight. Everyone will get killed. So there's a whole military mission to seize the new terminal. Now, the practice run takes place Friday night. The goal, twofold. 60 minutes or less from touchdown, Shukishami's flying the first plane, from touchdown to take off where we head to Nairobi. 60 minutes or less. Number two, the security cabinet has not given the green light. Has not given the green light. But, and I don't know what their note, their calculations were. This was the condition. If 25 or less are killed, if 25 soldiers and hostages or less are killed, it's a success. I apologize. I should say 24 or less. If 25 or more are killed, it's a failure. Yitzhak Rabin asks Menachem Begin, the opposition leader, please spend Shabbat in Tel Aviv. We will need you. The practice run is an absolute debacle. It goes terrible. You know the, the story how we're going to have a surprise, we're going to have a black Mercedes Benz? They called up the department of, what's that called? That we called it? When you, no, in, in America, what do we call that? The motor vehicles, the DMV. I know that gives everyone, I have palpitations when you mention that word. I start spazzing out. They call up, the, they go to the DMV in Israel. There is not one black stretch Mercedes in the whole country. All they could find in the Arab neighborhood of Jerusalem was that there was an Arab had an older model, white stretch Mercedes limousine. So they came to him under the following ruse. Now, we're going to go, you know, we're, we're going to go to war against the Palestinians. That's how they told him. They said to, they came up with a ruse. We're filming a movie, and this one was the director, and this was a producer. Listen, we need it. We need a Mercedes for the movie. We'll give you whatever you want. Don't worry about it. We may tweak it, but I tell you, anything we do to it, we're going to bring it back in even better condition. So he laughed at him. He says, this piece of ashpa, this piece of junk, you can have it. They didn't know what he meant. The car was such a mess. They had to get a Mercedes Ben's mechanic, and they had to quarantine this Nebuch, this poor guy. You know, his family didn't know what happened to him. He had to put in a new alternator, a new starter. Friday night, just one of the debacles that went wrong in a practice run, the car wouldn't start. They landed the plane, the car didn't start. They had to put in a second starter. They send the soldiers back to sleep. Yoni with squadron commanders. Yoni Netanyahu and the, the, the squadron, they spend three, four hours. They didn't go to bed till 3.34 4 in the morning. And they tweaked the whole plan. Because if it would have gone the way the practice run went, they would have gotten everyone killed. And they made a number of changes. Stop a second. Back in Uganda, 
the hostages have not showered all week. The morale is terrible. Just to give you an example, the reason they realized it was the meat that was tainted with E. coli bacteria, you remember this is an old terminal, they haven't used it for a few years. So half the toilets didn't work, they were backed up. The people who ate the meat that they were being served had terrible diarrhea, shilshul. The reason they knew that is because the ones who kept kosher were only taking like the fruits and vegetables, they didn't have shilshul. It's a mess. On Friday, a 73-year-old woman by the name of Dora Bloch, she went with her son, Ilan Hartuv. They were going first to Paris and then they were going to switch to England. Why? Because on Sunday, July 4th, her other son's wedding. The chasana from her other son was Sunday, July 4th. She chokes on the food that they're serving her on Friday. There's a doctor with the hostages says, I can't get it. We got to get her to the hospital immediately. They take her to the hospital. In the hospital, they're able to dislodge it, no problem. On Shabbos, Saturday, July 3rd, they're going to send her back to the airport. The Ugandan Minister of Health says, no, we're not. This poor woman, you send her back there, she'll get killed with the rest of them. He doctored her paperwork. He changed the paperwork that he had to keep her, to try to keep her alive and safe and protected. He kept her in the hospital. He was scared to death of Idi Amin, but he hated him. The security cabinet is told very clearly by Don Shomron and message through Yoni. The only way this deal works, we have to leave central Israel 11.30 Shabbos morning. We get to Sharm el-Sheikh 315 and refuel. We have to fly under radar going to Sharm el-Sheikh. We don't want them seeing a whole squadron heading in the direction of Uganda. They all flew in different directions and they met in Sharm el-Sheikh. We have to be out of Sharm el-Sheikh 345, 340. So they get there like 315, refuel and get out. Why? We're flying under radar. We're not flying direct over Yamsuf, through Eritrea, through Kenya, into Uganda. We're going to come in on the tail of the last flight that's going to land in Entebbe. It's a British Airways flight scheduled to land at midnight. We'll give it 10 minutes leeway. They called up Lufthansa because originally the last flight to land in Entebbe that night was a Lufthansa flight. And the Germans said, no problem. We will make sure that that flight never makes it to Entebbe. We'll say it had mechanical problems. We'll keep it in its place. And here's the logic. We'll come in on the tail of the British air flight, and that way the lights will be on. They take off. No approval. They don't have the luxury. They can't wait. Menachem Begin was called in by Yitzhak Rabin said, look, I don't know if this is going to be the end of my political career. I don't know if this is going to be the greatest miracle or the worst debacle. We're getting, we have nowhere. These negotiations are getting us nowhere. And we've got a plan, and I'm asking for your support. We have voted by a large majority finally to go with the plan. When is this? I'll tell you. 5.30 Shabbos afternoon. This is 5.30. Begin said the exact same words. It's irrelevant whether I agree or disagree with you. I happen to agree with you. But this is a time of a national crisis. It's not just a crisis for Israel. This is a crisis for Jews. And you know, it's irrelevant what I think. The world will know whether it is a success or whether it is an absolute destruction, a debacle. The world will know the day after and the world will know forever that I supported this thing. We don't play partisan politics in a time of national crisis. You all know who Yitzhak Rabin was. A very stoic man. I don't think he ever hugged Leah. He was a, he was a military guy, a stoic guy. The people who were there said that Rabin's tea, he welled up with, his eyes welled up. He actually hugged Begin. And don't get me wrong, 
They disagreed on many things. They were bali pluked on many things. But those two men were leaders. Those two men were leaders. They had taken off 330. They're on radio silence. The code word was one word. One word! He said it two times. He couldn't talk Shukishami to the other planes. 5.30, they got the go-ahead. They were already in the air. The other planes would pull up just to let them know that they're, they would pull up on the side just to let them know they were there. They flew over a Russian vessel in the Yamsuf. And one of these miracles of this story is why the Russian vessel never reported them. A Russian naval vessel. And they're flying, and everything is going well. Idi Amin returned from Mauritius. He comes to the airport roughly around 6.30 p.m. The black stretch Mercedes limousine followed by the Range Rovers. And he meets with the terrorists. And like he has before, he meets with the hostages. And I watched an interview of a young woman, a young Israeli woman, you know, a little bit of Israeli chutzpah, because they had been told when you have a chance, if he allows you to address him, you refer to our emperor as field marshal, general, president for life, Dr. Idi Amin Dada, lord of the lions and master of the fish. So this is a young girl. She wasn't thinking. Uh, president Amin. What did you refer to me as? My name is Field Marshal, General, President for Life, Dr. Edi Amin Dada, Lord of the Lions, Master of the Fish. So she was telling this story in the early 1980s. They had an interview with her. She was traumatized just telling over a story from six, seven years ago. George raises his hand. And of course, he refers to him with the whole Chad Gad Yeah, I won't repeat it. You know, you know Field Marshal, General, for the whole thing. He says, over the course of the week, you've shared with us your disappointment and your hurt and upset with our government, with my leadership, President Ford. I know you are a great man. I know you are capable of liberating us. And when you do, we will let our president know the greatness and how you have taken care of us and looked after us. And never again will America disrespect you when you come to the United Nations. He was trying to, we say Hanifa, he was trying to flatter him, hopefully get something out. Idi Amin responded, and I quote you, it'll take a miracle for you to get out of here alive. It'll take a miracle for you to get out of here alive. His wife, Rivka, Renee, I mean, she was an optimistic woman, a strong woman, trying to be mechazek, keep other spirits up. The balloon popped, and that was over for her when she heard that. So the Israelis are all saying, Mahu Amar, Mahu Amar, targem. George says, I wouldn't translate it. He says, we knew we were going to die. What, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to depress the Israelis in the group? We didn't translate what he said. Everything is smooth sailing, smooth flying, until they get over Lake Victoria. There's such a terrible thunder and lightning storm, a terrible thunder and lightning storm. They didn't think they were going to make it off of the lake. They thought that the lightning was going to take them down. Shuki Shami said, I'd never flown in weather. He says, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to fly in weather like that. <laughs> Those of you who are familiar with lake effects, what happened was it was a terrible storm, but it was a lake effect storm. When they got past Lake Victoria, when they were on, you know, a kilometer, two kilometers off the lake, you didn't have the same kind of thunder and lightning. And the lights were on. He lands the first plane. 
they stop on the tarmac and the soldiers get out, they have these battery operated lights. And they put these battery operated lights all over the tarmac. They get back, pulls up at the new terminal. What do they call that from the plane? The, the, the bow goes down. This time, unlike last night, with the second starter, the Mercedes started. One of the things they did, they realized they had way too many people in the Mercedes, way too many people in the Range Rovers. They needed them, but they were going to be bumping into each other. They took some of the guys off of that, and they take off. It's one kilometer. The San Hanim run out after them. Their job is to take control of the new terminal. Su and Hershko, as they're doing this, he takes a bullet to the spine. Su and Hershko, which is one of the many people I interviewed for this talk, will be a quadriplegic the rest of, the rest of his life. Su and Hershko cannot feed himself, cannot wipe himself. He's an amazing man, a thoughtful man. But literally, he's taken, he has to be held by his aides like a baby. He cannot use his hands, nothing. He is the honorary chair of disabilities here in the state of Israel. And he's an extremely fine, thoughtful man, but a tragic man. They're off. They're about halfway there, a half kilometer there. Everything seems to be going okay. What do they do? One of the changes they made from Friday night's debacle, if the Ugandan soldiers start shooting at us, we take a hit. We're not going to fight back. Our goal is the element of surprise. We've got to get to the hostages and not get into a firefight with the soldiers. We've got to get there. And here's the plan. Step one, there are always two terrorists. At the, there's western entrance. There are two there. There are two at the eastern entrance. Think about a terminal. It's all glass doors. Yoni is going to have to have someone seeing everything that's happening. He's going to set himself up as a sitting duck on the tarmac because he wants to see step one, which is the eastern and the western entrances. Get those terrorists. Step two, get to the VIP lounge because the other three terrorists will be sleeping in the VIP lounge and get to them before they come out with grenades, with guns. Step three, after you get to the VIP lounge and get the other three terrorists, you have to get to the stairwell. You have to get up the stairs to the second floor before the Ugandan soldiers come down the stairwell shooting. Everything seems to be going fine. Two Ugandan soldiers jump out onto the tarmac and try to stop the Mercedes. We don't know what they were thinking. Maybe it could be that since the Prime Minister, the President, Idi Amin Dada, was just here five hours ago. What would he be coming back? He already was here. Why would he be coming back 12, 15, 12, 30 at night? Yoni puts the silence on. <laughs> he got the first one. The other gets out of the way. This other soldier who they missed gets up and starts shooting. He's got a machine gun. The guys in the Range Rovers the members of Sayer at the Range Rovers, they shoot back and they get him. But the noise of his machine gun and their machine gun, only a half kilometer from the old terminal, is going to break the whole plan of the surprise. When that happens, he says, throw this thing! And they fly the other half kilometer. They get there. He gets out to the tarmac. Everyone from the Range Rovers, these guys to the east, these guys to the west, they took out Brigitte Kuhlmann and really Bus. They took out the two Palestinians. They got stage one. They get into, into the room, into the terminal. Before they could get to the VIP lounge, because of the fighting, the gunfight, the three terrorists had gotten out. One of them, they referred to him as Carlos. That was not his... Arabic name. They called him Carlos because he had come from Colombia for this mission. Now realize one thing. In the old terminal, it was a tinderbox. Carpet, mattresses, 
blankets, all this stuff, one spark, this stuff can all go up in smoke. In fact, the Air Force pilot that we spoke about earlier, the Air Force colonel, he said to George and Renee, if our guys come, you hear anything, you get to the bathroom and you crawl and get to that bathroom as soon as you can. Why? The bathroom is a stone floor. It's not flammable. And that's what they did. Carlos come out of the VIP lounge and he had a grenade. He lets it go. It didn't kill anyone, but they're shrapnel and it causes fire in that part of the terminal. Now, when the soldiers came in, they had bullhorns and they said, this is Sahal. Everyone stay down. Everyone stay down. Anything up, we will be shooting. There were two young women and a young, a very fine young French Moroccan Jew by the name of Jean-Claude Mimouni. Jean-Claude Mimouni, all week, while people were depressed, they were sick, when the food would come, he didn't eat it first. He would take the food and he would serve others. He was a joker. He was telling jokes, trying to keep people, their spirits up. They're on fire. What are you going to do? You're burning up. So they get up and start running away from the fire. Well, the soldiers see a young man with dark pigmented skin running at them. Jean-Claude Mimouni took seven bullets to the chest. All of them ours. We killed them. When they did a post-mortem on this, they said, have we, have, were we to do this again, we would have done the same thing. You told everybody to stay down, and he's running at you. Remember Elie Wiesel referred to our brothers and sisters behind the Iron Curtain as the prisoners of silence? A family by the name of Borachovich was allowed out by Brezhnev, and they had immigrated to Israel. Sarab Borachovich I'm sorry, Aida Borachovich, I apologize. She was shot. It, the question is, it's not clear to us, was she hit by one of the terrorists? That's one version that I've heard. The other version is it may have been friendly fire, might have been one of our bullets. But Jean-Claude Mimouni, Aida Borachovich, dead. Out on the tarmac, Yoni, who's coordinating this whole thing, is hit by a Ugandan sniper. The Chovesh gets to his body and he's looking for an exit wound and there is none. That means that that bullet had ripped apart all of his vital organs and he's not responding. There's a pulse, but he's not responding and the Chovesh knows it's just a matter of time until he's going to die. They get, after they killed the three terrorists, they got up the stairwell. They got up the stairwell before the Ugandan soldiers could come out. They throw some grenades in. The other Ugandan soldiers give up. There's a few of them in the bathroom. The door opens. You talk about the longest second in your life, and they hear, either this is one of the terrorists, and we're dead, or this is an Israeli soldier, and we've been saved. They're hiding in a stall. George is covering Renee. The stall door opens. Shavua Tov, we're here to bring you home. She looked up, it was a member of the Sayera, the guy had a keep on his head. Shavua Tov, we're here to bring you home. She says, you got to understand, I grew up in Williamsburg. I grew up in, we were educated by the Satmar. There's no such thing as a good Zionist. She says, I became the first Zionist in all of Williamsburg. There's no greater Zionist than me after what happened. They yelled now. They brought, remember the Peugeot trucks? They yell for everyone, get into the trucks. They're Americans, George and Renee. A soldier tells you, get in the truck. They were the first ones in the truck. She didn't have shoes, nothing. The Israelis, God bless them. No, I got, I, my camera's here. I got to find my backpack. No, no, I got to get this. Get in the freaking truck. There's a war zone. What are you talking about? No, I got to get. They said, 
They, they get them in the trucks. These, the, the soldiers, they're, gonna, they're committing suicide. They're going to sit on the sides of the truck. So if, if, it, if a Ugandan sn sniper, like the one that killed Yoni, if they're going to shoot, they'll take the bullet for these people they've never met. And they bring them the whole kilometer in these trucks to the plane. The longest amount of time was trying to get a count. These people were traumatized. They, they were, there was hysteria. They went to the, I think he's, I forgot his name, but I think it's David Pardue, the, the captain, the, the pilot of Air France 139. They said, please, whatever you do, make sure that all of your, your, your 12 staff members are here. We don't want to leave any of them. They couldn't get a count. They finally got a count. A young man, Ilan Hartuv, Ilan comes forward. He says, my mother, my mother's not here. He said, w w where's your mother? She's in the hospital. They said, we, we can't go to the hospital. We have to leave. So of the 105, two dead at this point, one missing, Dora Bloch in the hospital, some injured, but it looks like no serious casualties. Remember we said the goal was 60 minutes from start to finish? For, not finish of the soldiers, but finish of getting the hostages out? Remember the goal was 60 minutes? Friday night's debacle was 55 minutes? The real story, Saturday night? 51 minutes. Remember the security cabinet said the difference between success and failure was 25? So far, Yoni, Jean-Claude Mimouni, and Ida Borchovic. So far, three. They take off for Nairobi. The job of Shaul Mofaz and his crew is way after midnight. That was the only time you ever had fireworks on July 4th in Kampala, Uganda. Those RPGs, boom, boom, boom. I mean, the, the skies of Uganda were from the, from, the, from the MiGs, the MiG-4s and the MiG-13s. But they kept their word to the Kenyans. They put Surin Hershko on a stretcher, an IV. They put him on the plane. They landed in Nairobi to refuel. One of the hostages, Dr. Pasco Cohn, wonderful man, he took shrapnel from, from the same, you know, from the, when uh, Carlos let the, the bomb go, he had shrapnel in his thigh. It's not a fatal injury. They couldn't stop the bleeding. So they took him off the plane. There were Israeli doctors waiting in Nairobi. He died on the table. Not from the wound. He had a clotting factor. They couldn't get his blood to coagulate. And he literally bled to death. The third hostage. They took off. Already 3.30 a.m., the BBC is broadcasting to the world that the Israeli military has had a mission. That they've come, that they've they've freed the hostages. They don't know details, but they're already broadcast these broadcasting this to the world. In Israel, they're scared to death because these Hercules C-130s flying that low to the ground, they can't fly high because then radar will catch them. They're sitting ducks, and they can't communicate. They're on radio silence. Everyone was given earplugs, and everyone was told not to talk till we get to international area that we feel safe. Renee told me, you know, this is a cargo plane. They're, st they're holding on to straps. They're standing over this soldier. You know, you would think this was such a miraculous, he's, this dead soldier, they didn't know his name at the time. He said, we knew he was important because all the soldiers are just looking at him with like a glazed face, crying. Instead of euphoria, she said he must have been important to them. At 5 a.m. Israel time, which is 10 p.m. East Coast time in America, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin calls up President Gerald R. Ford. Mr. President, this is Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister. They knew each other because Rabin it, it, it served as the, uh, United, the Israeli ambassador to Washington in the United States. They had a relationship. I want to apologize to you. We did not tell you in advance. This was top secret. We were afraid of communications being tapped. 
but a raid has taken place. You may have heard they're starting to broadcast things. We don't know all the details, and they have not come back to safety. They're not over safe waters yet. But from the information we've gotten until now, there have been a limited number of casualties. And I'm going, and I apologize once again, I will be reporting to you on what happens. After a pause, it seemed like forever. President Gerald R. Ford responds to Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel. Mr. Prime Minister, you've just given the United States of America the greatest birthday present we could have ever asked for. What did he mean when he said, Mr. Prime Minister, you've just given the United States of America the greatest birthday present we could have ever asked for? What did he mean by that? What he meant was the last nation that had stood up against terror, that had stood up against these animals, these vicious animals would kill innocent people, had capitulated, had appeased. No, they hadn't. No, they hadn't. They were willing to stand up. The world would be safe. People could fly the skies of the world. The plane lands at Tel Dove. It's, I'm sorry, it's, is it Stay Dove? Stay Dove. Three men are there when the bow comes down. Prime Minister Rabin, Defense Minister Shimon Peres, and the head of the IDF, General Matagur. Rabin gives a very short, brief speech. And he talks to them. And then he ends as follows. I'm going to beg of you one thing. One thing I'm going to beg of you. Please, whatever you do, don't discuss the details. What kind of planes, what kind of guns, how many soldiers, what tools we employed, what methods we used. For sure not to the press, but not even to your families. So you can speak in vagaries. Don't speak specifics. If, God forbid, something like this happens again, we don't want the enemy knowing our methods. I'm going to ask you one thing. You tell a bunch of Jews to keep a secret. You tell a bunch of Jews to keep a secret. Come on, we were all, most of us were around in 76. Within six, seven months, you had the NBC movie with Charles Bronson, Bronfman, no, I'm sorry, Bronson. You had the, the Richard Dreyfus ABC movie, and then you had the Yoram Gohan movie, you know, from Operation Entebbe. What happened, Operation Thunderbolt. It, Three movies. Were the movies perfect? Did they have all the details? What I'm giving you now is stuff that became declassified the last couple of years. They had 85 to 90 percent of the details down. What happened? What little birdie tweeted in their ears? You know, what navi, what navua did God give them? You tell a bunch of Jews to keep a secret. It doesn't always happen. They get there July 4th. Now they get transferred after the Mossad meets with everyone, takes down the information, interviews them. The real tragedy of this story is what happened to the Mimuni family. The Borachavich family and Pasco Cohn's family, the IDF sent a psychologist to their home to let them know what had happened. The Mimunis left for Ben-Gurion before the psychologist got there. So the guys who were there representing the IDF called them in. You know, everybody's, everyone's coming off the plane. Everyone's being reunited with their family members. And the guys who are not psychologists, who are not trained to do this, said, we have some bad news. Your son died of an asthma attack. They started screaming, our son doesn't have asthma. They started going crazy. And then they opened up they, they, where the, su the son was, and they saw bullet wounds in him. Terrible. The, the terrible psychological effect it had on this family was just, just terrible. And when the idea finally acknowledged and told the real story, the father had already died, died of heartbreak. You know, years later, the, the, they interviewed his brother, who said, we, just, we, we could have lived with the truth if they would have told us the truth. And again, this was a tragedy because they had sent a psychologist to, to them, but had, they had left early for the airport. Israelis go home. The French were greeted by French consul generals at the airport. 
No one had a passport. They'd all been taken by the terrorists. So they gave him temporary visas, except for the two Americans. It's July 4th. Nobody's working on the 200, on the bicentennial of the United States. There was no one to greet them there. No one, no nothing. Monday, someone greeted, got them a temporary passport, and they flew out on Monday. They come back to JFK, to throngs of Jews who met them at JFK. When he meets his father, mother, and ho holding their baby who they'd been babysitting, his father quoted him a famous verse. I believe it's, uh, it's either capital Memdalad, probably Memdalad, maybe Memhe. We say it Saturday night. David HaMelech in Tehillim says the following. Podeh b'shalom nafshi mikrav. My life has been redeemed. I've been saved. I'm in a state of peace from the battle. Ki rabim hayu imadi. Not because of my zechuyot, not because I'm such a big tzaddik, but because the nation was praying for me, because the nation was crying and concerned for my and for the soldiers' welfare. His father said to him, the last week, the Jewish world has not slept. The last week, there's been Tehillim, prayer rallies, people fasting, people taking upon themselves mitzvot. I never knew if I would ever see my son again. I never knew if you would ever see your daughter again. But the reason you and I have been reunited is because the whole nation was crying and praying for you. Monday, July 5th, there's a special session of the Knesset. In 1976, not everyone had a television in Israel, but everyone had radio. And the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, a man of very few words, stoic man, got up and made a short, brief speech with a standing ovation in the Knesset. And then he invited, because the opposition leader Menachem Begin had asked to speak, he invited the opposition leader to the podium. podium. <coughs> that speech on July 5th, 1976, is maybe the most famous speech in the last 125 years of Jewish history. And it had three parts to it, and I'm going to truncate it in two minutes. The first part was he spoke about Rabin. He said the following, Prime Minister Rabin, I salute you. Defense Minister Shimon Peres, I salute you. And I salute every member of the Labor Party of the Security Cabinet that had to make the most difficult decisions this past week that nation leaders will ever be forced to make. But to you, Mr. Prime Minister, you are the leader of a team. And I know what that means to be the leader of the team. And while everyone deserves the credit, if it failed, the blame would be on your shoulders. That extra mashahu of achrayut that you had for the nation, who can weigh the size of that mashahu? And he really, in a gracious way, he praised the prime minister. And then for the first time, the world heard the name Yonatan Netanyahu. Of course, Ben Sion, his father, the preeminent historian of the Spanish Inquisition, was a friend. They were both peers, students of Zev Jabotinsky. But he said the following. He says, it's been 2,200 years since God gave the Jewish people the ability to defend themselves. He says, not since the time of the Chashmo Naim. And these young boys that flew halfway across the world that flew to sub-Saharan Africa. These are the Chashmo Naim risen anew. And they gave their lives for people they had never met, people they may never meet. And then the third part of his speech. And please understand one thing. In 39, when Hitler and, St Hitler and Stalin made the famous pact to divide up Poland, the Baltics, the Ukraine, what we know is the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. 
you're a Jew in 1939 in Poland. What are you going to do? You're going to flee and run east to the Russian side? Remember, Hitler did not want to have a two-sided war. It's bad enough he's got to fight the French and the British on the Western Front. He didn't want to fight the Russians. So he duped Stalin for two years so that way he could have a chance to defeat on the Western Front before he would take on Russia. What is your whole frame of reference if you're a Jew in 1939, September of 39? You know what your whole frame of reference is? World War I. The German soldiers in World War I were human beings. They didn't violate and rape women. They didn't ruthlessly slay people. They acted as soldiers, but they acted as soldiers with a sense of, 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 of the principles of war. Not the Russian soldiers. They were animals. They were barbarians. You're a Jew in September of 39. Where are you going to place your lot? Where are you going to place your fate? Under German-controlled Poland? Under Russian-controlled Poland? Or the Baltics? Or Russian-controlled Ukraine? The rest of Begin's family stayed in Poland, and not a one of them survived. Begin fled east. Begin, just to give you the background, when the Russians, you know, he didn't have a passport, he had a Polish passport. He would not take a vow and oath to communism. He was sent to Siberia. But that gut that he had, that intuition that he had, saved him. But he was haunted the rest of his life because he lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his community who were annihilated by the Germans. Begin got up and he said this was the third part of his speech. It was barely 30 years ago when on the dock of Auschwitz, when the cattle cars with the German dogs barking, when the cattle cars landed there, and it was the German doctors, Josef Mengele and the others, where a finger to the right meant you were dead, you were going to be gassed to death. A finger to the left meant slave labor. They would work you to death. Not 30 years later, and it was the Germans once again making a selexia. The Jews over here, the non-Jews over there. And then he started to raise his voice. Then, he said, then there was no one, no one to help us. Now, Akshav, Akshav, God has given us for the first time in 2200 years the ability to defend ourselves. If a Jew anywhere is in a state of peril, is in harm's way, is threatened, is abducted, he says, then this little country, the Yiddish Medina that we call Medinat Yisrael, if God gives us the ability, we will do everything in our power. If it means going to the end of the world to free, to liberate, to save our people. He says, this is the lesson of Entebbe. They said in the Knesset there was not a dry eye that morning, Monday, July 5th. And they said that the nation was listening by their radios at work, by their radios at home. The nation was crying, crying tears of gratitude to the Almighty. The malaise, the depression, going back to the 11 in Munich in September of 72, going back to the school children in Malot, going back to the Yom Kippur War when our boys came home, those who were lucky came home in body bags, the others, there was nothing left for their parents to bury, they were charcoal in their tanks. The depression and malaise that affected not only the Jews of Israel, Jews across the world, but primarily the Jews of the homeland, of the motherland, the events 
of that week in Entebbe, the events of July 4th, 1976, took us out of that malaise. That week in the UN, the world condemned Israel for the violation of Ugandan sovereignty, for the killing of Ugandan soldiers. The Eastern Bloc, the Arab nations, the Soviet Bloc, they all condemned Israel. The United Nations was a, was a kill fest that week. And behind the scenes, not only President Ford of the United States, but the leaders of Britain, Germany, and French, in France, they all said, now I'm using Arshbach, a grosse yashakoach, way to go Yidlach. And you know what happened? The French, the British, the German, and the Americans all patterned themselves, they all created their version of Sayeret Matkal. They all created in the image, in the model of Sayeret Matkal, an elite force that was trained specifically for these kind of purposes. For the next 25 years of history, and 25 years is not a small amount of time, until September 11, 2001, for the next 25 years, people could fly the airspace and the airways of this planet. People were no longer afraid of terrorism because a precedent had been set that we don't buckle and we don't appease or capitulate to animals, to Palestinian monsters who want to slaughter innocent people. We will not capitulate to the Palestinian monsters or the German Bader Meinhof or anyone else. Bader, who expected to be emancipated, when the German nation found out that 31 years after Auschwitz, it was Bader Meinhof members making Selexia. The whole liberal progressive part of Germany, the liberal progressive part of the population who, who empathized with Bader Meinhof was abhorred, was aghast at this. And everything turned. Bader ended up committing suicide because he saw the gig was up and he saw that the, 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 the population had turned. Yoni Netanyahu never got engaged, never got married, never had a family. We don't know the exact number, but I think it's fair to say that in excess of 1,000 Jewish children have been named Yonatan after Yoni Netanyahu. And I think it's fair to say that this tiny nation that had taken so many wounds and so many hits in the early 1970s could start to become optimistic again, start to rebuild, move forward, and create the great nation, the nation of Israel that we have today. And unlike the story of a 2,000-year diaspora, between 1967, that we'll relive on Saturday night at uh, Rabbi Weinshul, and between the story that we just relive today, tonight, Jewish people realized that there's a hand guiding our history. There's a hand guiding our existence, our continued existence. And although we don't always see it, there are times that that hand is so manifest that it gave us the ability to withstand all the tribulations and trials that have faced our people. And it gave us the strength to move forward and rebuild this great nation, this great nation that we call the people of Israel, that we call Medinat Yisrael. Thank you and wish everyone a good Shabbos. I left that out. What happened with Dora Bloch? What happened with Dora Bloch? The following, and this is a tragedy. The British Consul General
visited Dora Bloch on Monday, July 5th. They wanted to make sure that she was okay. Idi Amin was so humiliated, he sent his goons in on Tuesday. She was on the second floor of the hospital. The nurses try to stop these goons. They take a 73-year-old woman, grab her by her hair, rip her down the stairwell, put her in a car, they put bullets into her head. They murdered her. It was a known secret where her body was dumped because it was the same place that many others who were killed that, that were perceived as threats to, to the Amin administration. In 1979, when the people of Uganda finally overthrew Idi Amin, and our cousins, the Saudi Arabians, gave that animal, they gave him, you know, a hero. He lived the rest of his life. He was suffering from syphilis, but he lived the rest of his life in luxury and in wealth in Saudi Arabia. So Israel was able to send forensic experts. They had her dental records. And they dug in the area. It was a known secret where she and others had been dumped. Their bodies had been dumped. In 1979, she was finally given Kfuras Yisrael, a Jewish burial. Finally. She never made it to her son's wedding on July 4th. Last July 4th, the 40th anniversary, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I don't know, was, was he at your July 4th barbecue? He wasn't at mine. Was he at yours? You know where he was on July 4th? There was a Tekis at the old terminal of Entebbe Airport in Kampala, Uganda. Together with the nation of Uganda, the Jewish nation honored the brave, particularly his older brother Yoni, who gave their lives for freedom. Thank you.